Hello! The purpose of this video is to train you in proper aseptic technique, or in other words, how to prevent contamination of your cell lines. There are many different types of contamination that can threaten your cell cultures. For example, bacteria, viruses, and fungi are some common contaminants found in every lab. First of all, bacteria are very small contaminants that can't be seen with the naked eye, but they can barely be seen with a light microscope at 10x magnification as shown here. As you can see, the bacteria are much smaller than the animal cells shown in this picture. If you were watching these cells in real time, you would know that these black dots were live bacteria because they would be actively moving around, vibrating from one spot to another. Fungi and yeast are another common type of contamination that we're all familiar with both in the lab and at home in our kitchens. Most fungi and molds are readily identifiable by the circular fibrous colonies that they form, and you can see these fibers under the microscope as shown here in the bottom left. Yeast, however, is a unicellular fungi, so they're much harder to detect by eye, but they do appear as small dots, bigger than bacteria but smaller than animal cells, that usually grow in clumps, as seen here under the microscope at 10x magnification. Finally, Viruses are another common type of contaminant. They are especially hard to detect because they are extremely small and do not grow outside of the cell. Instead, they grow inside the cell and are therefore naturally camouflaged. However, viral infection can change the morphology of your cells, as shown in the image below. In addition, you may also notice that your cells grow at a much slower rate when they're infected with a virus than they would before that infection. Last but definitely not least, the most dangerous type of contamination is cross-contamination of other similar cell lines. For example, in this image here, we have HeLa and NIH3T3 cell lines, which are completely different cells from completely different species. But they look largely similar. Therefore, Cross-contamination of cell lines can go unnoticed for a very long time. While cross-contamination may or may not affect the way your cells grow, they will affect your experimental data. And it is absolutely essential that any time you perform an experiment on a specific cell line, it is the cell line that you think you're working with. This has become a huge problem in academia because it is very important in all of our experiments that we know exactly what type of cell line we are testing our drugs and other methods with. Most scientific journals nowadays require genetic testing of the cell lines used in your research to confirm that you are actually working with the cell line that you think you are. If those results come back and show cross-contamination, your results will not be published. So please, be extra cautious and take all the necessary steps to ensure that you do not cross-contaminate your cell lines and lose valuable time and data. The best way to prevent contamination is to remove any contaminants from the lab as quickly as possible. To do so, you'll need to learn how to identify contaminated media and other solutions. For example, when media gets contaminated by bacteria or fungi, it becomes very turbid or cloudy, as you can see here, where the tube on the right has bacteria in it, but the tube on the left does not. You should dispose of the contaminated media as soon as possible. Likewise, animal cell culture media will also become cloudy when it is contaminated with bacteria. In addition, these medias normally contain a pH indicator, such as phenol red, that changes color from red to yellow as the bacteria decrease the pH of the solution. Therefore, if you ever see any animal cell culture flasks that are yellow and cloudy, you should dispose of them immediately. So, while bacterial and fungal contamination are relatively easy to identify by eye, remember that viruses and cross-contaminated cell lines are invisible to the naked eye. In most cases, these contaminants can only be detected with genetic testing. In addition to identifying and eliminating any existing contaminants, you can also prevent future contamination by wearing the proper PPE. For example, gloves should be worn at all times in the lab. This is not only to protect you from any harmful substances you might be touching, but also to protect your samples from the bacteria and other fungi on your hands. Once you have your gloves on, Spray them with 75% ethanol to sterilize them. 
Thoroughly rub the ethanol into all the spaces on the gloves, including the spaces between the fingers, the backs of the hands, and your palms. A good practice is to continue rubbing until the ethanol dries completely. Remember, in addition to gloves, safety glasses are also required at all times in the lab. Safety glasses are especially important in biological labs since they will prevent any contaminants or pathogens from getting into your eyes. Finally, while lab coats aren't officially required, they are highly recommended in biological labs to prevent any bacteria or fungal spores from falling off your skin or sleeves into your sample. Once you've sterilized your gloves, you'll also need to sterilize all the liquid and solid materials that you're working with in your experiments. The most common way to sterilize both liquids and solids is to autoclave them at 121 degrees C for 30 minutes. However, you should never put anything in the autoclave that cannot survive these high temperatures. For example, DNA, protein solutions, and some plastics will melt at those high temperatures and should not be sterilized with the autoclave. And remember, you should never autoclave anything containing bleach since it will release toxic vapors, and you should always let the autoclave cycle fully complete before opening the door to avoid exposure to steam. If you need to sterilize a solution that's not thermally stable and cannot be autoclaved, an alternative way to sterilize it is by using a 0.2 micron filter like the one shown here. Most bacteria and other pathogens are larger than 0.2 microns and therefore will be retained by the filter. However, it is important to mention that most viruses are smaller than 0.2 microns, so they will not be removed by this method. To use the 0.2 micron filter, remove the plunger and attach it to the filter. Next, pour your liquid solution directly into the syringe and put the plunger back into it. The liquid that may then be sterilized by forcing it through the filter. If at any point you notice a large amount of back pressure in the filter, do not continue to press harder. If you continue to apply greater amounts of pressure, the syringe filter will fail and it will spray its contents out everywhere. Instead, remove the current filter and replace it with a new one. Another way to sterilize solids is to spray their surfaces with ethanol. This is a pretty effective technique for pipette tip boxes and pipettes, but you should always remember that ethanol only sterilizes the surface of materials. It does not sterilize their insides. An alternative way to sterilize surfaces is to bathe them in ultraviolet light, such as the one found in the biological safety cabinet. UV light decontaminates surfaces by damaging any DNA that it comes into contact with. However, this process is only partially effective and only works when the surface has a direct line of sight to the UV source. Therefore, if you must sterilize something with only UV light, it is recommended that you do so for at least 30 minutes to ensure that the surface is mostly sterile. But you'll never be sure that the surface is absolutely sterile. Once you've sterilized your gloves and all of your different materials, it's time to start working with your cells. Bacterial work occurs mostly on the bench instead of the biological safety cabinet. To prepare the bench for bacterial work, start by removing as many of the materials from your workspace as possible. Next, thoroughly spray down the area with 75% ethanol and wipe it down with a paper towel. This will completely sterilize the bench surface. After the bench has been sterilized, sterilize all of your solids, including pipette tips and your gloves. Remember to thoroughly dry the ethanol off of your gloves before lighting any Bunsen burners, since the ethanol is highly flammable. Once the Bunsen burner is lit, you may bring all the rest of your materials onto the bench and keep them as close to the flame as possible, since the flame actively sterilizes the air around it, but it only works for a short radius. Next, visually inspect all of your liquids to make sure that they're not contaminated. They should all be absolutely clear. If they're turbid, you'll need to make new ones. When using a pipette on the bench, try to keep the tip as close to the flame as possible without heating it up. You should also pre-loosen all the lids on all your bottles before getting a pipette tip. If you have to loosen a lid midway, you should discard the old tip and get a new one immediately. This will allow you to minimize the amount of time that the pipette tip spins out in the open air, thereby minimizing the potential exposure of the tip to any potential contaminants. 
If you are working with any glass bottles, sterilize the neck by holding them in the flame before putting the caps back on. You should also put the caps and lids back on any tubes as soon as possible to minimize the amount of time that they are exposed to the open air. It is also very important to remember that the pipettes we use may be contaminated. Therefore, you should only ever stick a pipette tip just far enough into a liquid solution to get the sample that you need. Do not fully submerge the tip and never submerge the pipette body into the liquid you're trying to sample. If you do accidentally submerge a pipette though, immediately wipe it off with a chem wipe to prevent any chemicals from accumulating on it. Finally, once you're completely done working on the bench, shut off the gas and remove all of your materials from the workspace. Next, completely spray down the bench with 75% ethanol to sterilize it and dry it off with a paper towel. By sterilizing the bench after you've used it, you can greatly reduce the chances of any cross-contamination between this experiment and the next experiment that happens on the bench. If you ever need to use animal cells for your experiments, you have to work with those in the Biological Safety Cabinet, or BSC, instead of the bench. This is because animal cell cultures are highly prone to contamination and therefore must be worked with in a very sterile environment. We keep the BSC sterile by never working with bacteria inside of it. This includes any agar plates or liquid medias that you might have. Never ever bring any types of bacteria into the BSC. In addition, any materials you plan on using in the BSC must be thoroughly sprayed down with ethanol before putting them inside. And as always, you should spray your gloves with 75% ethanol and thoroughly rub them until dry before beginning work inside the BSC. Remember that lab coats, because they have sleeves, are also highly recommended to prevent contamination. Once you start working in the BSC, you'll occasionally have to leave it to retrieve samples and do other tasks. If this ever happens, you must respray your hands with ethanol before re-entering the BSC, since your gloves may have become contaminated while you were out. It is also essential to keep the BSC as free of clutter as possible while you're working inside of it. This is because excess materials can provide hiding places for contaminants that protect them from exposure to 70% ethanol or ultraviolet light. Most importantly, excess clutter can also block the vents and keep the BSC from working properly. If the vents are blocked by supplies, then the air won't be filtered and contaminants could potentially accumulate in these spaces. You should also work at least four inches away from the front vent to protect your sample from any airflow exposure that may occur. In most BSCs, you'll find a beaker that is used to collect used pipette tips. This beaker should be emptied out at the end of every experiment to prevent the accumulation of any contaminants. You should also keep a close eye on the aspirator tank and empty it out whenever it's 50 to 75 percent full. It is very important that you not let it overflow, since overflow could damage the aspirator pump. Begin by loosening the lid on the aspirator tank and placing it outside of the BSC since it is probably contaminated. Next, remove the tank from the BSC and pour it down the drain. We can do this because the aspirator tank is kept sterile with bleach. Therefore, its contents should be completely sterile and can be poured down the drain. Next, put the aspirator tank back into the BSC and replace the cap. Try to screw the cap on as tightly as possible since it will need to maintain a vacuum. Once the cap is on, slide the pump back into its place. As I mentioned earlier, the aspirator tank is kept sterile with bleach. Therefore, each time you empty it out and put it back into the BSC, you need to fill it up with at least 100 ml of bleach. You can do this by inserting the aspirator tube into a bottle of bleach and turning on the aspirator pump. By doing it this way, you'll sterilize both the aspirator tube and the tank in one foul swoop. Once you've added 100 ml of bleach to the tank, turn off the pump and tightly screw the lid back onto the bleach. When you're done working in the BSC, thoroughly spray down all surfaces with 75% ethanol. Next, close the sash and turn on the UV light for at least 30 minutes. 
This combination of ethanol and UV light should keep the BSC completely sterile as long as it is also clutter-free. Finally, remember it is very important to immediately dispose of any used cell cultures as soon as you're done with them, since used cell culture media can provide breeding grounds for potential contaminants. You can refer to the waste disposal video for more information on how to get rid of old cell cultures, but overall, remember that large liquid cultures can be autoclaved and pour down the drain. Small bacterial and animal cell cultures can also be autoclaved, but it's usually much easier just to sterilize them with 10% bleach. This can be done in the BSC with animal cell cultures, or you can simply mix bacterial cell cultures on the bench with 10% bleach. So in review, if you follow these eight basic tips, you can prevent contamination of your cell cultures and save yourself a lot of time and wasted effort. First of all, always use sterile liquids and supplies when working with cells. Secondly, Keep materials sterile by working near a Bunsen burner or in a biological safety cabinet. Another way to maintain sterility is to keep lids on liquids, cells, and supplies whenever possible. Always try to minimize the amount of time these materials are exposed to the open air. Also remember that when transferring liquids with pipette tips, you should only barely insert the tip into the liquid, just enough such that you can suck up the liquid. Don't completely submerge the tip and definitely do not submerge the pipette itself into the liquid since that may contaminate it. If you need to work with bacteria, remember that's only done on the bench. You should never bring bacteria into the BSC. We only culture animal cells inside the BSC. In either case, you should always check medias and buffers for contamination before you mix them with cells. In addition, you should change your pipette tips frequently and never leave them in the open air for very long. If you're ever in doubt, just discard the old tip and put on a new one. Likewise, your gloves are always at a constant risk for contamination since you touch a lot of materials in the lab. Therefore, your gloves should periodically be sterilized with 70 or 75 percent ethanol, especially if you touch something that may be contaminated or if you have to leave the BSC and go back into it. And last but not least, the best way to prevent cross-contamination is to only work with one cell line at a time. I know it may save a lot of time to work with two cell lines at once, but you're always running a risk that one cell type might infiltrate another and then all of your data will be ruined. So please, only work with one cell line at a time. And that's about it for this video. Just remember, the key to proper aseptic technique is ensuring that all of your materials are clean or sterilized in some way and keeping them sterile by being very cautious. And even when you've sterilized a surface or a material, you should always treat it as if it was contaminated just in case it does happen. That being said, I wish you the best of luck in your experiments and I sincerely hope that you never encounter any type of contamination. Good luck!